I'm really delighted uh, this evening to welcome uh, Dr. Shannon Shah, who is Director of Faith for the Climate. I think it's a predominantly UK-based group, but I'm, I have no doubt with some international dimension to it, whose mission is to encourage, inspire and equip faith communities in their work on the crisis of climate change. It's hard to boil down Shannon's accomplishments and contributions, um, his contributions to academic and public life, just to a few simple statements, but uh, here goes. Before relocating to the UK in 2010, Shannon balanced careers in human rights advocacy, journalism, and theatre and music in his native Malaysia. Here in London, after receiving a doctorate at King's College London, with whom he maintains active links through the INFORM initiative, Shannon is tutor in interfaith relations at the University of London worldwide and a fellow of the London-based Muslim Institute. I would say confidently that this conjunction of experience and perspectives leaves Shannon really well placed to speak on tonight's topic, which is climate justice, what's faith got to do with it? I for one find the relationship between faith and political activism a fascinating one, far more complex and multifaceted than some might presume not least because there are often many legitimate um, and healthy political perspectives on most public challenges. So I'm looking forward so much to learning from this evening. Shannon will be speaking for roughly half an hour, um, after which time there will be uh, there'll be lots of time, hopefully, for questions and discussions. So get thinking about points you may want to raise as prompted by Shannon. So um, having given that introduction, Shannon, over to you. We're just having a little difficulty, technical difficulty with Shannon's camera, which um, we can't um, get to. My camera is fine, but it says I can't start my video because the host has disabled it. <laughs> yes, yeah. which I can't find that I've done. In fact, we can see lots of other faces on here. Um, and I've just logged off and logged on again but I still can't start my video. Okay. Um. Shall I try making you host again, Shannon, and see whether that yes. works, and then Please. you pass yes. it back for the screen sharing? Yeah. I think Please that would be fine. Yeah. Let's just do that then. Um. Okay, you should be host now, Shannon. Oh, oh there yeah. And I'll make you host again so that you can share my slides. <laughs> Good between us, okay. we worked it out. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. And um, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much, Stephen. I'm sorry I, I missed the nice things you said about me because I was trying to work out how to start my video. Um, but yes, thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, and nice to see some familiar faces. Yes, John Woodhouse, hello. And um, Dr. Elizabeth Burns and some people from the University of London whose names I recognize. But anyway, in the interest of time, I will get straight into it. Uh, let's start with a bit of a visualization, uh, a visualizing exercise. So you can close your eyes for a few minutes if you wish. So ready, if you want to close your eyes, you can close your eyes now. So imagine that you live by the sea. And imagine in the past few years, the sea level is rising where you live. And you know that there have been times in the past when this area that you call home has been hit by big, big storms or hurricanes, but this is different. How do you know this is different? Because you know what people from your parents' generation or even your grandparents' generation have said about the sea and also what local historical records and oral histories have said. So this is new, or rather you've really just started paying attention in recent months and years because it's not just the sea level changing, 
In the last few years, some weeks have been freakishly hot and dry when they weren't meant to be. And in some years, there are other weeks that have been freakishly cold and wet when they weren't meant to be. But anyway, the sea is now submerging your house. This is your home, where your loved ones, essential possessions and treasured memories are. Where you have made connections with extended family, neighbours, visitors, wildlife, beaches, gardens, groves, your local church, your local spiritual community. Everything drowns. And now imagine that you have no money or even the presence of mind to repair your home, no means to support your loved ones. What do you do? If you've kept your eyes closed, you can open them now because this is where I usually stop when I'm given 10 or 15 minutes to speak. But today I have around half an hour. So I'd, I'd actually like to press on now. Um, you don't have to close your eyes again, but I will continue. And this may get upsetting. I mean, it's a story that certainly upsets me, no matter how many times I imagine it or tell it. But anyway, let's continue. So imagine that your community once thrived because it received the ocean's bounty. Maybe there was always an abundance of small oily fish that gave everyone in your village sustenance. And the fruits of the ocean also resulted in a very healthy and tasty local cuisine, that formed part of the vibrant local trade and relationships um, with neighboring villages. However, in recent years, fish meal factories have sprouted all along the coast where you live. So these little fishes are no longer caught by local villages, villages but by big industrial trawlers. And after they are caught, they're not used to feed people, they are turned into fish meal to be shipped to a richer part of the world far away from you to feed farmed salmon or to be turned into pet food. This is in a part of the world where they don't even know you exist, where they don't even realize that the salmon that feeds one person for one meal has probably consumed enough little fishes that could feed several families for an entire day where you come from. Now imagine that elsewhere in your country, the government is corrupt. It insists that it is pursuing green policies, but it continues to award contractual agreements to companies that extract your country's resources with impunity. And community leaders, religious clergy, journalists, and local residents who protest the government's policies and trade agreements are threatened with hefty fines and jail. And there have recently even been mysterious disappearances and unexplained deaths of key local figures in your vicinity. But you, you've just lost your home. You think that the fishing issue and the sea level rise must be connected, but you don't really know how to explain this. You're not a scientist. And you've been told enough times that there are so many other reasons for what is happening. It might even be your own fault, you are told. And amid all of this, your existential priority is finding a new home. There is a solution, you are told. Move inland. Even moving just five or six miles inland will save you and your loved ones. But where exactly will you settle? Who will you live among? How do you start over? I'll end here for now. And let's take a breath. I need to recover too after reading that aloud because what I've read is a deeply human story. It happens, it's very real. It's one of many, many true experiences happening in many, many parts of the world now. What does it have to do with climate change? Now for the purposes of my talk today, this story that I opened with is a powerful illustration of the different ways that we can think about climate change. So for example, there is kind of what's, what's known as a dominant scientific or technical paradigm of climate change, which sees climate change primarily as an environmental issue and one that we should look at scientifically and find scientific solutions for. So this paradigm often sees climate change as a global problem with all countries, people and environments impacted. And we all thus have a common responsibility to solve climate change together. 
And at times, people who hold this point of view will say that climate change can be successfully addressed without actually modifying current global power structures, for example, economic or political systems. And also, this point of view often emphasizes that everyone in the world has equal responsibility to adapt to climate change or to mitigate its effects. For example, by planting more trees, eating less meat, switching to electric cars, and so on. And that market-based solutions are the best way of tackling the problem. The example I have just given, however, suggests that there is another way of looking at climate change. Firstly, climate change is not only an environmental issue, but it's fundamentally one of human rights and social injustice. It has social and political causes, and it will require social and political solutions. Secondly, all countries and peoples are not equally vulnerable to climate change, and their capacity to respond also differs dramatically. And since we are now in Black History Month in the UK, I'll give a local example for those of you in the UK. So people of African and Caribbean descent in the UK are disproportionately way more likely than anyone else to be exposed continually to illegal levels of air pollution, to live in poor housing, and to have jobs that expose them to multiple environmental hazards. And they are also more likely to lose a greater share of their livelihoods and their lives in extreme weather events. So I'm not saying that climate change is racist. Climate change is not racist. People are racist. But what I am saying is that it's a mischaracterization to frame climate breakdown as merely a global issue where everybody is impacted equally because it follows that those historically most responsible for climate change should actually be the ones that step up and take the appropriate amount of responsibility in addressing it. And then according to this second paradigm, successfully addressing climate change therefore requires a re-evaluation of global political and economic systems. And finally, in this paradigm, priority should be given to those who are most vulnerable to climate change because they are overwhelmingly the people who are the least responsible for causing it. And this is what many scholars and activists refer to as the climate justice paradigm. But what does faith or religion have to do with climate justice? So I'm reluctant to give a single authoritative answer, but I can share some perspectives based on my work with Faith for the Climate. So let me tell you a bit about us. And let me, before that, in case you want to have a look, I'll just put the link to Faith for the Climate in the chat box. There you are. So, the Faith for the Climate Network was founded in 2014 to help organize the pilgrimage to Paris at the time of the UN Conference of Parties on climate change in Paris, which was known as COP21. So COP, C-O-P, stands for Conference of the Parties. Parties to what? Parties to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. So it's known as the UNFCCC. So anyway, enough jargon. So we are now coming up to COP26, uh, which is going to happen in Glasgow in a couple of weeks. So COP21 is where the historic Paris Agreement was signed. And around this time, Faith for the Climate was founded by Canon Giles Goddard, who is vicar of St. John's Church in Waterloo, and also a member of the Church of England's Environment Working Group. And the network has always had an interfaith ethos from the very beginning, but on a practical level, um, at this time, it was quite small and consisted mostly of ecumenical Christian leaders and grassroots activists. I'm sure many of you will recognize some people in this picture. Um, and they are here they are standing on the steps of St. Martin in the Fields next to Trafalgar Square just before starting their pilgrimage. But since 2014, we have grown. Um, our first interfaith symposium was held at St. John's Waterloo in 2016. And then we held a second interfaith symposium in February 2018 at the Liberal Jewish Synagogue in St. John's Wood. And here, Lord Deben, who was the chair of the Climate Change Committee, then spoke. 
And then in June 2019, we helped to organize the faith and interfaith events ahead of the time is now, which was the largest ever mass lobby of parliament. And then in late 2019, when we found out that the next UN conference on climate change, COP26, was going to be held in UK, uh, together with the Environmental Issues Network of Churches Together in Britain and Ireland, we convened a working group of faith groups in the UK concentrating on COP, COP26. And this was scheduled to take place in Glasgow in November last year, but it had to be postponed because of the coronavirus pandemic. And it's going to take place, um, as I said, in a few weeks. And this work with Churches Together in Britain and Ireland and a few other organizations has led us to form an informal coalition of faith groups, which we call Make COP Count. And I'll tell you more about that in a moment. Uh, besides our work on COP26, our focus now is on grassroots interfaith movement building. So for one thing, we have a capacity building project that brings together grassroots leaders from Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim and Sikh communities in the UK, which is funded by Religions for Peace UK. And in the past 12 months, we have started providing online interfaith workshops on climate justice to communities in Leicester, Leeds, Bradford, Greater Manchester, and South London. So our events bring together formal religious leaders, such as bishops, rabbis, imams, and priests, and also lay community members and activists of all faiths, um, so that they can work together to provide thought leadership and to work together to respond to the crisis of climate change. Now, we're not doctrinaire on how we define faith or on what counts as action on climate change. So, for example, our network will include um, individual lay members of mainstream church denominations who've only heard about climate change recently. Or they might include activists who are involved in Extinction Rebellion, who come from Christian, Jewish, Buddhist or Muslim backgrounds. And we also work very closely with religious development organizations such as CAFOD, um, Christian Aid, Tear Fund, Islamic Relief UK, and Quakers in Britain. We do have some restrictions in how we operate. So we prioritize climate action, and we are nonpartisan. And we prioritize promoting events, resources, and actions based in the UK, or that are at least accessible to people based in the UK. So we tend not to engage with anything that doesn't fulfill these criteria. But apart from this, we try to be as inclusive as possible. So people come into the Faith of the Climate Network with very unique and diverse and personal experiences of religion and spirituality, which then motivates their passion to care for the planet in very different ways. So some of them are interested in things like fossil fuel divestment. Others are interested in things like tree planting. Um, others are interested in retrofitting of homes. You know, some are interested in the issues more generally. So different people come with different things that they want to do as well. And so because of this, our understanding of climate justice as a network on the whole is always evolving. But one significant catalyst for the evolution of our understanding of climate justice um, came from the work that we started to do on COP26 through Make COP Count. And I will share the link to that in the chat now as well. So you can see this as one of the projects of Faith for the Climate, um, Make COP Count. So it's an, as I said, it's an informal coalition. We chair it um, and it is co-chaired by, as I said, the EIN of Churches Together in Britain and Ireland. And we also work really closely with our interfaith partners in Scotland as the host country of COP, um, as well as our secular climate partners, um, such as the Climate Coalition. So we initially met every two to three months online after the first lockdown in March 2020. And then starting from January 2021, we've been meeting monthly online and now have a work collaboration space on Slack. And during this period, our membership has also grown. So Make Cop Count, like Faith for the Climate, was initially overrepresented by Christian denominations and aid organizations. But now the coalition also includes contributions from Buddhists, Muslims, Hindus, Sikhs, and Jews. And over the past 18 months, through collective discussions and consensus, we came up with some priority actions. And these culminated in the two advocacy areas that we wanted to focus on. 
And we chose these advocacy points based on where we understood through our discussion that faith groups, especially interfaith groups, could have a distinctive role to play and a distinctive impact to make in the lead up to COP26. So we decided to focus on finance and global justice. And I will now paste the uh, areas of focus that we had in the chat. So there you are, put it there. So let me explain the second item first, um, an end to all use of public money to subsidize fossil fuels. I mean, that's actually the easier one to explain. I mean, lots of groups in the UK and abroad, um, including lots of the religious development organizations we work with, have already been campaigning for years and years about overseas funding for fossil fuels. And they achieved a significant success when the UK government finally changed its policy in December 2020. So the campaign is now focusing on subsidies that still exist within the UK, because the UK's announcement was about its investments abroad. Um, so we're now talking about subsidies within the UK. I mean, for example, the UK government claims it does not have fossil fuel subsidies, but it really does. And it's reporting on all of this is quite opaque. So for example, there are still tax breaks that the UK government awards for oil and gas extraction. And we know that fossil fuel subsidies actually disproportionately put poorer people at a disadvantage. So that's quite easily explained, normal fossil fuels. Um, let me now circle back to the first item about loss and damage. Uh, so what is loss and damage? Well, the example I opened with is a very paradigmatic example of loss and damage. Why do we use the term loss and damage specifically? Because under the Paris Agreement, there are three main pillars of climate action. The first is mitigation which means cutting emissions to avoid global heating as far as possible. So this is stuff like no more deforestation, no more digging for new fossil fuels, no more burning fossil fuels, that's mitigation. The second pillar is adaptation. It's what it says on the tin. It's how we change our buildings, the way we use land and transport and so on, so that we can adapt to and live with the impacts of climate change. And then there's a third pillar, which is loss and damage. And loss and damage describes the impacts that are so severe that societies cannot adapt to them anymore and where mitigation just won't work anymore, including things that change slowly, are changing slowly, like sea level rises, not so slowly anymore, and extreme weather events, such as severe hurricanes and severe droughts, which are happening more and more frequently. So what does loss and damage actually look like? What are the implications of it? There are so many examples that I can choose from. All you need to do is scan the headlines over the last six to 12 months. But I'll focus on one example that's connected to the worsening impact of cyclones and hurricanes around the world. So in 2019, Cyclone Idai killed more than a thousand people left 400,000 people homeless and destroyed 700,000 hectares of crops when it struck Mozambique. And international fundraising appeals raised less than 50% of their target. And because of this, this forced Mozambique to start borrowing from international institutions. And bear in mind, this is a country that already has quite a high debt burden. And many other countries are trapped in a similar spiral of worsening climate debts, which they cannot address, climate impacts, which they cannot address because of the burden of debt. And as I mentioned in my opening story, loss and damage also includes what in the Paris Agreement is referred to as non-economic losses. And this means things that you cannot put a price on, like biodiversity, sacred lands and sites, sacred monuments, cultural monuments, local traditions, local community networks, and so on. And here's where climate justice comes into the picture. 
because at Make Cop Count, we as people of faith believe that loss and damage funding needs to be financed by those who have been most responsible for the crisis, not those who are already struggling, for example, we can introduce measures such as a global levy on the airline industry or a global fossil fuels tax or even debt cancellation for global South nations, right? So the money can be found. It doesn't need to be paid directly from government coffers. There are different ways um, to, to finance uh, addressing loss and damage. And I've added uh, a resource in the chat that you can look at. Now, the UK government and other rich nations in the global north have been extremely reluctant to talk about loss and damage because this raises the question of historical responsibility for climate change, or what activists and scholars refer to as climate debt. But in recent months, the UK as COP26 president has actually opened up the political space to discuss loss and damage, but the word finance has been conspicuously missing from these discussions. Even so, this caveat notwithstanding, we must remember that this increasing political visibility of loss and damage is actually the result of campaigning by civil society groups, including faith groups such as Faith for the Climate and Make Cop Count. I mean, we just heard yesterday from an international colleague who was present at the Vatican when the Faith and Science Declaration came out last week, that he was actually pleasantly surprised at how firmly the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, spoke out on the issue of loss and damage finance. So I might be overstepping my bounds but I'm going to claim this as one of the impacts of our work at Make Cop Count, because one of the bodies we have been engaging with very closely is the Church of England. Uh, and let me just give you a link to more resources on loss and damage in case you are interested. So we'll end the slide share for a bit because here's perhaps where I can do a bit more shameless promotion of our upcoming activities. So uh, we will be going to COP26, Giles and I, and one of our colleagues, Roche, will be in Glasgow for the first week of the conference because we are organizing an interfaith panel discussion and an exhibition in the Green Zone. Um, the Green Zone is the publicly accessible portion of the conference. The Blue Zone is where negotiators and accredited officials are allowed to go. Um, you do need to get tickets because of COVID restrictions, but it's free and open to the public. Um, apart from this involvement, and in Glasgow, Giles and I will also be speaking at several side or fringe events organized by our friends from Buddhist and Muslim communities, local churches, Extinction Rebellion, and our partners in Scotland. Um, in the lead up to COP26, we are also one of the national organizers of Faiths for Climate Justice, which is a global multi-religious action on the 17th and 18th of October. So some background. Um, uh, Stephen said initially that there is an international dimension to our work and this is it. So uh, we are one of the 15 national partners and founders of the Green Faith International Network. And it's in this capacity that we're organizing this event, um, Face for Climate Justice, and I will put this there. So here's a summary of what Face for Climate Justice is about. Um, I'm reading this from the Green Faith website. So as people of faith, we believe that the earth and all people are sacred. We are calling for an immediate end to new fossil fuel projects, deforestation and related financing, a massive commitment to green jobs to reduce climate pollution and end poverty for millions and climate reparations from wealthy countries to equip vulnerable nations for a better future. So what's going to happen? So on Sunday, the 17th of October, all around the world in temples, mosques, synagogues, churches, and other religious buildings, um, people will be calling for climate justice by ringing bells, singing hymns, praying, meditating, calling out the azan, sounding out the shofar, whatever is true to people's traditions, right? And we'll also unfurl banners that make it clear to people that the time to act is now. So this is the symbolic action part of the day where we show the public what people of faith uh, care about. And in the UK, actions have already been registered in Glasgow, Greater Manchester, Wakefield, Leeds, Liverpool, Sheffield, and London. And one of the actions um, will happen at St. John's Waterloo, which is coordinated by Giles and me. So if you happen to live nearby, please come. Um, you are most welcome to. Uh, the details are in the chat. Then the next day on Monday, this is the power holders moment. This is when 
people of faith all around the world will try and do actions that focus on governments or businesses um, that are climate records. So for example, in Australia, our colleagues will descend on the Australian parliament. In the US, they'll be focusing on the asset manager, BlackRock, and also the White House. Um, in the UK, we have worked very closely with Christian Aid, CAFOD, World Vision, Tier Fund, and Islamic Relief to hold an interfaith vigil in central London. So people will gather um, in front of the Houses of Parliament, um, in the Palace of Westminster, and then they'll walk to Downing Street. And there, faith leaders from five communities, Christian, Muslim, Jewish, Hindu, and Buddhist, will deliver an open letter to the Prime Minister detailing all the action that faith communities in the UK have taken on climate justice. Again, if you're around, do join us. It is open to the public. Um, it's outdoors, it's COVID safe. Um, so here's a snapshot of all the actions that are happening all over the world. Um, I wonder if Simon can share the slide. That. Yes. So these are the actions that are already, already registered. You can see in the US, Sub-Saharan Africa, Europe, Latin America, Australia, Southeast Asia, South Asia, and so on. I mean, some of the highlights include, I really love this one and it's really powerful. So the leader of the Pacific Council of Churches, which is based in Fiji, will actually be having photographs taken on an island, which now goes underwater at high tide. This is happening now in Fiji, it's drowning as we speak, and that's where they're going to hang their banner. Um, in Jakarta, in Indonesia, the largest mosque in Southeast Asia, which is very close to national government buildings, will unfurl a banner that says destroying the planet is haram, which means forbidden in Arabic. And then the Catholic cathedral across the avenue will be unfolding a very similar banner with Christian messaging. And so in Indonesia, it's become a Christian Muslim event and they'll involve their school children from their Muslim school and Catholic school as well in this. So that will be quite powerful. Um, yeah. Anyway, th there are many ways to get involved. Uh, in the interest of time, I will just skip to my conclusion now. Uh, so I've told you a lot about Faith for Climate Justice. I've told you a lot about climate justice and Faith for Climate. Here's perhaps where I can share some personal reflections to round this off on the strengths, on what I see as the strengths and limitations of faith-inspired perspectives of climate justice. So firstly, a bit about me. Um, I'm Malaysian, I am Muslim, and I am gay. Um, none of this is private information. Everyone I work with at Faith for the Climate knows all of this about me. But I don't dwell on these personal characteristics with them, and I don't want to do that now either. I'm just saying this to you because I think this disclosure is important for you to understand that these aspects of my identity um, have profoundly informed and continue to inform my experiences of spirituality and social justice. So, for example, I am extremely critical about the many unjust and oppressive ways that Islam is interpreted, practiced, or politicized in Malaysia and in many parts of the world. But at the same time, I am Muslim. I am a deeply believing and passionate Muslim. And I also come from quite a multi-faith background in Malaysia. My extended family includes Christians of different denominations, Buddhists, Sikhs, and Hindus. So interfaith relations are part of my life. And it means that I've always known that whatever criticism I can make about Islam can also be made about any other religion. And since coming to the UK in 2010, I'm also very aware and critical of the pervasiveness of Islamophobia and racism, despite the existence of <laughs> legislation like the Equality Act. So I've already said that I'm deeply inspired by faith and my heroes are people who are passionate spiritual advocates for social and environmental justice from all faith backgrounds. Jalaluddin Rumi, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, Dr. Martin Luther King, the Muslim feminists who mentored me in Malaysia. Um, and I'm also a sociologist of religion. So I understand religion as a social construct and I'm aware of all the social scientific debates surrounding the very category of religion itself. But again, I don't want to dwell on that. All of this is to say that I am sometimes concerned that you know, climate to environmental work by faith groups can sound a bit too feel good and it can recycle some 
unhelpful stereotypes. So the, messing, the messaging is usually something like, oh, we all love this planet and our fates inspire us to hold it as sacred and a divine gift and so on. But actually much of the environmental destruction and social injustice we see today has actually happened with the complicity or direct impact of many religious institutions and authorities. I mean, just think about the annexation, colonization and exploitation of indigenous peoples and their lands in the Americas, Africa, Asia and the Pacific. At the same time, each religious tradition also has the moral teachings and power to challenge this from within. And I think this is why it becomes so potent when faith groups do talk frankly and honestly about climate justice. It's not that we negate the importance of appreciating the transcendence or imminence of the divine. It's not that we're turning the sacred into a political tool, but it's us coming together. It's us being connected to each other because there are people of faith all over the world and it's a trans-border phenomenon. A Muslim in the UK will have relatives or friends or people that they identify with in other parts of the global south. Christians of all denominations, Buddhists, Jews, Hindus, Sikhs, and so on. This is a tangible reason why it's powerful. And there's also the moral argument, because we have teachings about repentance, humility, forgiveness, interconnectedness. And I've seen all of this come very profoundly to the forefront through the people of faith that I've met in my work. It stirs them, it makes them want to do better. And it often makes them want to set aside, you know, petty disagreements when they're working on something as important as the climate crisis. I mean, this doesn't always happen. There are still conflicts within the, <laughs> within the climate sector, but by and large, I think it's a beautiful story. And it's one that I come across over and over again in my work at Faith for the Climate the best of the people I've met realized that climate justice involves a lot of inner soul work as well as external action. They understand the importance of action and contemplation, which is, I think, what faith traditions can bring to this very important issue. And this is exactly the kind of moral and social energy we need to address the climate crisis. So I think I'll stop there for now because um, I think I've gone slightly over time, but thank you everyone. I'll just put something in the chat now uh, for you to find out more about Faith for Climate, but there you are, thank you. Good. Well, um, Shannon, thank you so much for that very heartfelt overview of the work that you were doing. And in particular, I think the, um, uh, intensely personal perspective that you bring you clearly throw your all into it and I'm sure that, that there are those around you who whom you inspire and 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 that you take inspiration from um, I'm sure that um, it's prompted a lot of thoughts in people uh, maybe who find um, a fresh uh, vigor um, in wanting to manifest their faith in this way, or maybe with other, other questions or um, points of uh, debate. Um, I'm wondering how we should do this. I'm still an amateur at this. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if, if, if people would like to ask a question or make a contribution or respond to what Shannon has said, um, please feel free to put up your hand or create a a, a, a suitable emoji um, and I'll, I'll, I'll get going with questions. Thank you to the couple already who have. Um, I, I, I'm going to th throw some, something in. Um, there, there are always um, shades in any discussion of this sort um, and, and part of it may be about emphasis and part of it may be about picking battles that you feel that you can win and partly it might be sort of deeper conviction of, about what is right. But, but maybe to a, to, a, to a person of faith who is a, a skeptic, um, I'm sure you would say, uh, Shannon, um, just listen to the recording of this talk and see if you're still a skeptic at the end of it. But are there sort of just two or three things that you'd boil it right down to if you had, you know, the, the classic one minute elevator journey with a skeptic? What would be the, the two or three things you said to them, which, which really encapsulates this? Um, a skeptic about a, a, a person of faith, but a skeptic about 
the the the, the underlying um, uh, rationale um, about the ability to do something about climate change um, that there can be human action. I think that's a really good question because you know that there are not just with the climate crisis but with so many issues of social injustice they are so difficult to overturn racism is still with us you know um sexism exploitation of the poor all of that is still happening but i would take examples such as the the civil rights movement in america and the role that black churches played the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I mean, he's a real idol of mine. And how he works together with other people. I mean, one of his best friends in this journey was the Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, who is also a hero of mine. And this was a perfect example of Jewish Christian relations to do something good. And there was a victory in the end. The Civil Rights Act did pass. You know, it's not been great. I mean, Martin Luther King very famously said after his I Have a Dream speech a few years later, you know, the dream has turned into a nightmare. And in this instance, he was talking about the Vietnam War. But in the Vietnam War, he made another friend, a Buddhist monk from Vietnam, Thich Nhat Hanh. And this is, I think, the legacy that we need to hold on to as people of faith. You know, there will always be forces that try to overturn this or block this. But mm. I don't know. It's it's that psalm, isn't it? Uh, Many rivers cannot quench love. Mm. This, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Let's let's throw it open to the floor then. Um, I'm not as familiar as Simon with some regular attendees, um, but uh, John and Liz Woodhouse. So you can come off mute, even go on camera if you'd like. I can't, I can't go on camera. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Okay, but we can hear you at least. And Shannon knows me. Well, actually, I've never actually met Shannon, but I've met him online a lot. And I'm very impressed by what he's said tonight. Uh, he's encapsulated. Actually, his answer to your question is really important for the Catholic Church, because we've got a lot of priests out there who don't want to know about uh, climate crisis. And um, one of my roles as a Laudato Si animator is to try to get the message from Pope Francis into our parishes. I'm working really, we've been working really hard on that. Uh, just one comment or sort of a question, really. It's been said that um, climate activists tend to be white middle class. And it strikes me looking at Shannon's photographs tonight, this is not true because, in fact, people of other faiths represent so many different diversities. And that's a good thing, and we need to celebrate that. Um, I just, just a quick response. Thank you so much for that, John. And that is absolutely true. Um, and Green Faith International as a network that we, that we are a part of the network, uh, a network that we are part of definitely tries to bring this to the forefront as well. So for example, at COP, three of my colleagues who are women of color, who work with Green Faith will be there. And I'm working with them to see what sort of events they can speak at. So the Reverend Dr. Nedi Astrudio is um, a Venezuelan eco-theologian. And uh, Mary Nwara is a Seventh-day Adventist from Kenya. And Nana Firman is a Muslim from Indonesia. They are all fantastic climate justice activists. And, you know, yeah, I'm so glad they're going to be in Glasgow. Um, and uh, John, John knows that I'm a huge fan of his work as well. I mean, the Pope Francis is also one of my heroes. I mean, <laughs> Laudato Si and Fratello Tutti are just fantastic documents about climate justice. I think if anyone wants to know about climate justice, they just need to read those two encyclicals. Very good. Um, actually, before we go to uh, Maria, Maria, you're up next. Um, I'm going to um, create, um, Shannon, if you... Um, uh, send me all of, or make sure that I've got all of the links and so on. I'll create a little bit, a, a document which I'll post onto our website. So if anyone hasn't caught them today, um, then then they'll be able to look back tomorrow. Anyway, Maria, please. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Shannon. It was a very, very interesting uh, uh, talk and, you know, all these uh, links that you put in the chat, I have already visited them. Thank you very much for that. 
So that, that's the reason uh, that I am today uh, as a Heathrow alumni uh, in that virtual uh, event, in that uh, talk about climate change, because I'm personally interested. And actually, my PhD is on climate change. And what I find, uh, you know, I wanted uh, actually what you are doing, this interfaith uh, uh, movement, let's say, with the climate change action, it's for me a very good example that when people are coming together, when they find when they work together instead of taking a very individualistic approach, uh, that it's more uh, it's easier to, to to succeed and do things. Obviously, with the climate change, uh, it has gone to a very political and uh, economic level at, at that point because it's too late, let's say, and we need to take you know global action. That's why we have the. Uh, you know, all these uh, meetings as they have now in Glasgow. So, yeah, we need to take this global action. But, uh, you know, my, uh, my idea and my concern is how did we get here? And I think that we did get here because of this individualistic approach that, yes, I'm an individual, I have my rights and I don't care about what is happening to... Uh, uh, Malaysia, what is happening to uh, South America and so on. Uh, but uh, there are examples like the ones that you are doing now that we need to belong somewhere. It's that feeling of belonging. It's that uh, feeling of community uh, because this is where we do start to, to care about something which is close to us and which we understand. So if we start from the, you know, small scale projects within our communities, we learn slowly, slowly, we, we develop a sort of a, a civic virtue as well. And we learn to care about uh, our, you know, what we can call home. So this starts in our home, in our neighborhood, uh, in our community, in our country, and then the, the world as a whole, isn't it? So, yeah. And what, what you are... I wanted to ask you, so what motivates you? So we have people of different faiths and backgrounds, as you say. Uh, so what really you think it's what keeps you, uh, you know, going and fighting for that? What, what keeps you going? What, what feeling is that? I think the thing that keeps me going is... I mean, first of all, thank you so much for that. That was a really wonderful um, kind of commentary on where, where we are at and what needs to be done. What keeps me going is uh, it's working together with people whom I respect more and more every day, um, mm -hmm. through their tenacity and their passion, and who are from different faith backgrounds. So one, one friend that I've made on this journey works with the Quakers in Britain. And before working in Faith for the Climate, I've always had a lot of respect for the Quakers, but mm -hmm. I've never worked so closely with them. And to be able to share that, and I've made Jewish friends and Hindu friends and Catholic friends and Methodist friends, and you know, yes. and doing it together is so inspiring. And when we get down, it's, we get down together as well. <laughs> we feel down together and so, somehow that lifts us up again, knowing that we all find it challenging. Yeah. It's that, that power feeling, you know, powerful feeling of working together, isn't it? Regardless of, you know, it doesn't have to be the religion that, yeah, we need to share the same religion or the same race or the same, uh, you know, color or whatever. But yeah. it's, it's that... Uh, feeling of you know belonging that we have a goal together a purpose isn't it yeah yeah okay brilliant brilliant thank you very much thank you there we are. you're welcome yeah. just, thank just you so very, much for that carry on just, Shannon. sorry just shortly as well it's also about problem solving um the project that i talked about that we work with the four minority faiths on so they actually it's an interesting project because they are trying to transform their own communities so the Muslims are trying to transform mosques, the Hindus are trying to transform mandirs, and the Sikhs are trying to transform gurdwaras, the Buddhists are doing work with Buddhist communities, but they meet every month to discuss with each other their strategies. 
So the Hindus will come and say sometimes, look, there are these people in my temple who are blocking what I'm trying to do. Like there are some leaders who are quite resistant to talking about climate. And then the Muslim will come in and say, okay, I've tried this in my mosque. This is what I've done with the imams. Maybe this might work in your temple. Maybe what's different? And, you know, because they're from South Asia, like the Muslims are mostly Pakistani, the Hindus are mostly Gujarati Hindus. Um, they have common cultural references. It's really beautiful to watch how they get together and problem solve. <laughs> and kind of, it's, it's almost like um, they, they just take for granted that they have different religions, but they, they share common issues and they problem solve together. So that's one example as well, how it works. Thank you so much. Um... Okay, we have um, Santana Lewis or Lewis Santana. I'm not sure which way around. Hi, it's Karen actually. That's that's. Uh -huh. there uh, we are. Thanks, Shannon, for your talk. Uh, just uh, it seems to me that uh, when you come across people of faith, it it seems to be a minority that are really engaged and enthused about climate issues. And I was wondering, seeing that most of the world is comprised of people of faith and with your organization which is um, multi-faith um, whether I mean with Pope Francis's landmark encyclical Laudato Si that you mentioned and Fratello Tutti um, you know whether it could be that people of faith could look at their scripture and their texts to see the source of uh, the you know care of uh, creation and the environment and that 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 is a central part of, of the faith. And perhaps that might be a way to maybe engage more people of faith in it, um, you know, in this such an important, um, uh, you know, crossroads that we're in. I'm just talking purely of people of faith because I, uh, the impression I get is with climate activists, we don't really hear so much about the faith component, you know? Uh, and I think it is key because we are a majority, people of faith. So I, I just like to hear your comments on that, really. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I think we're in a funny position with Faith for the Climate because, you know, religion is in decline in the UK. Church membership is dropping. Um, and I think this is true even of the minority faiths. But even then, it's not it's declining, but it's still significant, right? There's still a significant change that we can make, especially when we work together. And as I said, we have connections to people in different parts of the world. So the Muslims that I work with in the UK will have connections to Pakistan, Bangladesh, Indonesia, and so on. You know, the Hindus that I work with will have connections with Fiji, India, Malaysia, and so on, and the US. So um, that's important. Those connections are important. And the ways that, as I mean, picking up your other point, the ways that people are thinking about their teachings and their scriptures is also changing. Um, I was speaking to a Sikh activist yesterday. She's based in Bradford. Um, and she was saying how, you know, it's really made her look at the Sikh scriptures anew, you know, because when she was growing up, she thought they said one thing. And she never thought about climate or environment. But she goes back and looks at Sikhism, at Sikhi, and she thinks, wow, this is all about environment. It's all about caring for the planet. And it's completely changed her perspective as a Sikh. So that is happening. But, you know, the, the, the downside is <laughs> we, we do attract those people on the fringes. They're not the majority. You are right. You know, um, the people who do join Faith for the Climate are the ones who are trying to move their congregations and communities and are finding it difficult. And I think this is why they're pleasantly surprised when they come to Faith for the Climate and they find a home in it. Like I said, when the Muslims learn from the Sikhs and the Hindus learn from the Buddhists and so on, and they realize they have common challenges, I think that's what energizes them. But that is a challenge. Um, they are trying to move congregations and communities sometimes that they feel frustrated by. Is the honest answer. But it's so inspiring when 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 you are able to show and see and, and, and relate stories where people have seen a new depth in their own scriptures and potential in their own communities, I'm sure. OK, thank you. Um, so just uh, maybe just one more. Um, uh, and it's uh, Vanessa. 
No, um, thank you very, very much for your talk. Inspirational. Um, you mentioned some of the um, uh, documents that could come out of the Catholic Church, and I'm just from the last question. Have there been some really important fatwas or resolutions from, say, the Islamic Fiqh Academy or something that have really, you know, been helpful where you can say, actually, I can now hold this document and say, um, I'm obligated as a Muslim or in the Jewish world, have there been response from who are the, who are the sort of really important authorities who have been really groundbreaking in this and helping moving this sort of from a religious legal Sharia halakha, what, what has happened in this? Well. Again, that's a really good question. And because it's multi-faith, I think it's important to realize that not all announcements or rulings work in the same way in different traditions. So, you know, Fratello Tutti and Laudato Si work in a certain way because the Catholic Church is structured in a certain way. Um, and that structure is not replicated in, say, you know, Sunni Islam or, yeah, in lots of other religions and so on. So, it, it you know, there's, there's no encyclical in Islam. There's no, there, but there are many different fatwas in different local environments. So I know in Indonesia, there are fatwas against deforestation and so on. Um, they're not global. They are specific to Indonesia, but they exist. Uh, on a more global level, say with with the example of Islam, there was the Islamic Declaration on Climate Change, which um, came out in 2015 before the Paris COP. It hasn't had as much traction as Laudato Si. So there will be a new, more comprehensive Islamic Declaration. It's not going to be released now, um, but they're building up to it. It's called Mizan, which means balance in Arabic. So it's about, you know, finding the balance. Um, between ourselves and creation and within ourselves and so on. And that's quite a global effort. But I think they'll only be launching it properly next year. But they are using COP26 as kind of the pre-launch. You know, they're going to start talking about it there. And then they're probably going to um, release it maybe in somewhere like Qatar next year. I don't know if they've uh, finalized yeah, that. Yet. Who are they? If you, you say they are this and they are who who are they? It's it's a group of Islamic activists and religious scholars from around the world. Thank you. Okay. Very good. I'm I'm just looking at the time now, and I think we we've reached the sort of hour of the um, conversation. Um, so I'll, I'll I'll draw it to a close. There is so much food for thought, um, including in the discussion um, and 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 follow up. So um, on behalf of uh, us all, I'd, I'd like to thank you, Shannon, for putting your heart and your soul into this conversation this evening. I think it's changed all of us in many ways. And I'm sure that some of the uh, thoughts that you shared with us and some of the facts and some of the um, you know, really big challenges that you've been talking of will be ringing in our ears. Uh, in the next days and of course especially when COP26 itself is on I think you've provided a commentary for us all to um, to use as a reference um, as we start to hear more media about it so thank you uh, thank you so much uh, we will um, put a recording of this onto the website and as I said within the next day or two by the end of the week um, I'll have uh, posted all the links into onto our website as well so before we close, um, please be sure to note the date of our next online talk, um, which also promises to be highly uh, stimulating. It'll be on Wednesday, the 1st of December. It's on our website, 7pm, uh, when Fiona Ellis, Professor of Philosophy of Religion at the University of Roehampton, will speak to us on the subject of desire and the meaning of life. So that's another <laughs> huge subject. Um, Zoom details will be uh, put out to the association members shortly, but added to the website as soon as we've set it up. So finally, thank you once more, Shannon. Um, thank you all of you for joining. It's been a really enjoyable conversation. I apologize for the fact that people who wanted to have their cameras on couldn't always, um, but I hope it hasn't spoiled the enjoy enjoyment and the uh, challenge um, that has been brought to us tonight. So enjoy the rest of your evenings or the rest of your days, depending on where you are. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.